Welcome to Egg on Air and our live session with Crystal Morn. I'm Gia Mirando, Director of Marketing here at Data IQ, and I'm thrilled to introduce Crystal as she discusses, discusses the crucial relationship between humans and technology involved in differential privacy as it relates to security, regulatory compliance, and provable fairness. Crystal is a second year PhD candidate at the University of Vermont. She is currently researching provable fairness, differential privacy, and machine learning most interested in humanistic science invention and research that empowers all people and impacts their lives positively. Crystal, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Gia. It's really great to be here today. So um, I will start my presentation. And hi, everyone. I'm Crystal Moon. I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Vermont. My talk is titled Differential Privacy, Down the Rabbit Hole of Curiosities and Conversations. Today, we are going on an adventure. I'd like this to be a journey we can take together, understanding why data and privacy is so hard, trace other people's rabbit holes and see where we end up today. But first, a little bit about me. I started in Trinidad and Tobago went to school for film, photography, and visual arts at Ithaca College, and then went to California and loved it. California is full of rabbit holes and different kinds of people, like musicians, artists, scientists, entrepreneurs, and even people who don't know what they are yet. And that's okay. For me, it was a place I jumped into one rabbit hole with authority and ended up somewhere else I never imagined. Life is like that sometimes. Anyways, from there, I randomly decided that I wanted to pursue a PhD in computer science in Vermont when presented the opportunity. My first rabbit hole, I was curious about how, how things are made and I like people who are energized by making things. I started out building camera and light packages in Hollywood for all sorts of movies, but then I got curious about how the technologies I was using were manufactured. So I started trying new things like 3D modeling, welding, number theory, woodworking, learning how to sail, making art robots, and then realized this computer science thing was pretty creative and cool because it seemed to touch all the spaces that I was involved in. And I wanted to be part of understanding what it was all about. I left realizing that research was a creative way of combining all the things I loved and that it could help impact broader society. But I realized that I shouldn't lose touch with the communities that helped me find my path. Even when you go down rabbit holes, sometimes you have to be able to find your way back. This is how I found my research interests, provable fairness and differential privacy, because it involves technology and people. And a lot of privacy problems involve choices people make and people themselves, both as individuals and group entities. If you work in your IT department at work, you get it. You tell people in your company all the time to change their passwords, not to use their date of birth or love or sex or God, which is a hacker's movie reference, as their passwords. But this doesn't work. And even with tools such as 1Password, LastPass, etc., people still reuse old passwords, leading to vulnerabilities because, well, people are infallible. So what do we do about these human-centric problems that translate into larger issues that can result in a loss of capital? To do that, we should begin to talk about what privacy is, what differential privacy is, and how it is tied into larger concepts that promote equity for the human population and our systems. Privacy started as a way to protect capital. So it basically started when people started owning things. It gives power to the user. Depending on how you see the world, this might immediately set off some red flags because of the implication that the ratio of wealth one might have might influence the way someone views privacy. And you'd be absolutely right about that. It's important that throughout this talk, we realize that not everyone in the world views privacy in the same way or even considers privacy to be a human right. We saw these kinds of inequities play out worldwide. This article by Lily Hay Newman in Wired Magazine talks about the increase of phishing attacks, contact tracing scams, and ransomware attacks that have increased since COVID. 
In it, Lily Hay Newman talks about how these scams specifically target groups tied to economic relief, unemployment, and health. Furthermore, they have targeted those organizations with less resources to spend on skilled personnel needed to protect data in schools and other such institutions. Lily Hay Newman mentioned that in the past 30 days, more than 4.7 million malware incidents were detected in the education industry and shows how a 17-year-old boy by the name of Jagger Henry found that across platforms used in educational institutions, students were able to access the data of other students. Jagger Henry also found a multitude of other vulnerabilities, which you can read about in this article. But let's get back to privacy. If we can agree that privacy is important and that in some capacity it should be protected, how can we define it? Since we can't agree, what are the legal implications of privacy? Well, according to GDPR, a data processor is an organization which processes personal data on behalf of the controller. So for example, payroll providers or cloud providers. A data controller is an organization or person who determines the purposes and means of the processing of personal data. How have vulnerabilities increased since COVID? Dan Raywood of Info Security Magazine has said that just under half of businesses have experienced at least one business impacting cyber attack related to COVID-19 as of April 2020. This means that both data collectors and data processors have been affected. It means that businesses that act as our cloud providers storing our data and even those that don't have been impacted. In the article, Dan Raywood quotes research of 416 security and 425 business executives by Forrester Consulting and Tenable. The research showed that 94% of executives have experienced a business impacting cyber attack or compromise between April 2019 and April 2020. He defines this as including a loss of customer, employee, or other confidential data interruption of day-to-day -day operations, ransomware payout, financial loss, and or theft of intellectual property. This article by Ellen Sheng details that data breaches have increased 273% in the first quarter compared to the same time last year. Most of these articles talk about how IT and data departments are suffering from a lack of control and confusion as coronavirus has gripped the world, changing the way we live and work. Ellen Shen quotes a VMware report that indicates that ransomware attacks are up 90% and that destructive attacks, a form of attack in which data or ne networks are destroyed, is up 102%. One of the key things to take away from this article is that Sheng mentions Al Pasquale, who is the chief operating officer of Breach Security, who says that fraud rises in times of crisis, particularly in a bad economy. This results in various governmental agencies, educational institutions, and businesses paying hundreds of thousands in Bitcoin and lost revenue. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world at this moment, and these articles show us that depending on solely IT departments at this time is not enough. We as persons working in companies that deal with data need to protect the PII of customers and employees. But what is privacy and what is security? And are they the same? Not really. Security is protection from theft or damage. Privacy is the right to have some control over how your personal information is collected and used. Microsoft researcher Kristen Lauter describes privacy as having a key to a box, but giving access through a glove box of sorts to operate on your data but only you have that key. So it gives you ultimate power over your data to protect your PII. And what is PII? PII or personal identifiable information is specific information used to identify an individual. You can think of it as your data fingerprint. In the UK, it includes data such as your email address, your mailing address, and phone numbers. The problem is that in addition to businesses and organizations that need to protect our data, Humans are also quite messy at not leaving trails that reveal PII. We leave perpetual breadcrumbs of data everywhere. Two key concepts in PII are de-identification and re-identification. De-identification 
is a process that is a process that prevents someone's personal identity information or PII from being revealed. Re-identification is a process in which anonymized data can be matched with its original owner. That is, it is no longer anonymized for specific individuals. When I was growing up, I loved puzzles. My family, as it turns out, loves murder mysteries. Miss Marple, Poirot, Inspector Morse. Watching those shows growing up was part of my family tradition. And one of my favorite book series growing up was Nancy Drew, the female detective. Today, given this trail of data that people leave in their lives, data becomes a puzzle for solving a person's identity. One of the most famous examples of re-identification is that of the Golden State Killer who committed burglaries, rape, and murder between 1974 and 1986. In this particular case, the use of genetic software led to Joseph James D'Angelo, who was 72 at the time of, of his capture. This image is from an article from the Washington Post. The case was controversial because of the use of personal data in public policing. However, I have to emphasize that this case was not trivial or easy. Investigators had to pour through not just distant relatives, but they spent four months building out his family tree and using census records, obituaries, and gravesite locators but they were able to re-identify the identity of the Golden State Killer by linking information that existed from a trail of users in a database of volunteer genetic data and a sample they had of genetic material. In 2014, an article written by Fast Company in which data junkie Chris Wong was able to obtain 20 gigabytes of data from 173 million taxi trips was written. The data was supposed to be anonymized, but due to a mistake by the Taxi Commission, Canadian computer science Vijay Pundarangan was able to de-anonymize the entire data set in less than an hour. Similarly, Newstar privacy researcher, researcher Anthony Takar was able to use the data to show which celebrities took specific cabs at what, at what time by cross-referencing these images of the stars getting out of taxis at those specific times and how much they tipped. So let's look at another puzzle. Bob McClary is a writer who lives in London. He lives in Kensington, he's a bit posh, and attended Imperial for graduate school. However, Bob also loves movies. His username is Imperial Bob 1954 because it's just easy for him to remember who he is logging in. So according to the, these two tables, we might be able to conclude with some guarantees that these are the same Bobs, even though they're two separate tables. Unfortunately for Bob, this is terrible because we, can, we have proven that we can identify with some degree who he is. The reconstruction theorem is a theorem that shows that given access to a sufficiently large amount of information, someone can reconstruct underlying databases and in theory, identify individuals. It is a kryptonite of privacy researchers everywhere. This really happened, and this was done by a real life Nancy Drew by the name of Latanya Sweeney. In the year 2000, she showed that 87% of Americans could be uniquely identified by zip code, birth date, and sex. In 1990, the Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission released anonymized data on state employees that included all their hospital visits. At the time, William Weld, the governor of Massachusetts, had assured that patient identifiers had been removed. In response, Latanya Sweeney found the governor's hospital records. Her knowledge that the governor resided in Cambridge, along with the complete voter rolls for the city, which she purchased for $20, which included names, addresses, zip codes, date of birth, and sex for all voters, was able to re-identify the governor's health records. And so she just sent them back to his office. So how does differential privacy help us? And what is differential privacy? Well, first let's talk about what differential privacy is not. Differential privacy is not an algorithm. Rather, as researcher Dr. Cynthia Dwork says, differential privacy addresses the paradox of learning nothing about an individual while learning useful information about a population. What does that mean? Well, in practice, it means that I can learn something about the group but not a specific individual in a way that exposes their identity. 
differential privacy is not an algorithm for, for disclosure control, nor a guarantee against disclosure risk. On a high level, main parts of differential privacy are provable guarantees, noise and randomization. So what does provable mean? Provable means that it provides a mathematically robust definition of privacy that allows it to not be subject to attacks based on having auxiliary data. Randomization and noise is typical of differential privacy systems in that the degree of noise is tuned by the privacy parameter epsilon. More noise equals more privacy. Advantages of differential privacy are composability, privacy guarantees that are robust to post-processing, tunable privacy, protection against database reconstruction acts, and interpretability. Every time the analyst queries, they receive an approximation of the actual value that is based on the tuned degree of noise. So more noise equals more privacy. Sometimes the value is more than the value that you receive, and sometimes it's less than, but we can't tell what the actual value is based on that. However, an astute observation is that the database could just be queried by the analyst a bunch of times, and they would eventually uh, receive the actual result or a very close result to the actual result. Um, so with, with close accuracy. Theoretically, you could, with an infinite number of queries, recreate the data distribution. And this is where the budget comes in. A part of differential privacy systems is often a budget that's used so that only a certain budget or number of queries is allowed. What this means in practice is that you are returned a useless result after this budget uh, runs out, which mitigates opportunities for database reconstruction. It's also worth noting that a disadvantage of having a budget is that each use of privacy data must be tallied in the loss in the privacy loss budget. In practice, the budget is optimized for performance or blocks of memory cells rather than recalculating the usage of privacy budget for every single query. So does uh, differential privacy actually work? In practice, they are used with hybridizations of other privacy constraints, but they have been employed in real world systems. Some of these systems include the census bureaus, which uses reconstructions of microdata with such precision that it has to pass a disclosure avoidance system in terms of accuracy. Microsoft, which uses OpenDP, and OpenDP is an open source differential privacy initiative through Harvard University. Um, and Microsoft uses uh, OpenDP in their browser and in Azure. Apple uses differential privacy in iOS and macOS. And Google uses differential privacy in Google Rapport, which is used in Chrome. The Census Bureau uses small area data, which provides characteristics of residents down to the block level and microdata, which are full records typically lumped together by 100,000 people. There are other methods of secure computation, such as multi-party computation, homomorphic encryption, and federated learning that I won't go into in this talk. Often systems using differential privacy in practice use a hybridization of secure computation and differential privacy. And this is because one of the issues for differential privacy in practice is that for it to be effective, it has to be implemented in a very specific way. It is important that we consider the worst case scenario in the systems that we build because differential privacy, based on the extent to which that epsilon value is, is tuned, is a trade-off between privacy and utility. It is important to note that there is no safe value for setting epsilon, although there are general recommendations and this is an active area of research. This, this is a great uh, paper right here on challenges of, settling, of setting epsilon, considering both the views of the data and of the analyst. I'm gonna segue a bit from privacy and talk about AI and then to the field of fairness, which uses concepts from differential privacy. So what about AI? So this article from John Christian Use, um, says that users on Reddit have found that when you typed in words such as dog in Google, translate 19 times, garbled religious prophecies would be spit out. Unfortunately for the persons who believed it to be a conspiracy on Twitter, what they realized was that Google Translate may have been gathering texts from emails or private messages, specifically when Google started using neural machine translation. The article continues to say that in neural machine translation, the system is trained on a large amount of data in one language and corresponding translations in the other. But if it is fed nonsense inputs, the system can hallucinate and output nonsense. 
So this is a fun example of how neural networks and AI can sometimes lead to problematic outcomes. So much is dependent on the data that you feed a neural network. And this is why fairness is important. So on to fairness. As I had mentioned, data and privacy as seen together are a variable concept. During the pandemic, we have seen in areas such as health and education, various degrees of inequity. We saw children who have no access to internet sitting outside of McDonald's, trying to use the Wi-Fi to do homework, while others had access to learning pods. We saw communities band together to make masks, while other communities were disproportionately affected by COVID. Here is an example by the Wall Street Journal that talks about how students without Wi-Fi access use McDonald's outlets to study. Anton Tronofsky outlines the digital divide, which no doubt has worsened during the pandemic. The photos are taken by Megan Haller of the Wall Street Journal. Fairness is a problem in machine learning today. On June 24th of this year, this article came out in the New York Times. This gentleman, Mr. Robert Julian Borchak Williams, received a phone call from the Detroit Police Department. He initially thought it was a prank. He was handcuffed in front of his wife and two daughters in Farmington, Michigan. When his wife, Melissa, asked why he was being arrested, the police told her to Google it. As it turns out, this case is important because it is claimed to be the first case of an American being wrongfully arrested based on a flawed match from a facial recognition algorithm. The larger problem was that we have faulty systems that unfortunately have a lack of diversity in the images used to develop the databases. So the data suffers from sampling bias. Ideally, these systems should be tested rigorously for bias, particularly if they're going to be used in arresting or sentencing humans. In September of this year, the EFF wrote an article titled, Technology Can't Predict Crime. It Can Only Weaponize Proximity to Policing. It talks about how Santa Cruz was one of the first cities to experiment with predictive policing programs in 2001. In June, they became the first city in the US to ban municipal use of predictive policing, which uses data-driven analytics to predict who will commit future crimes and where they will occur. The article argues that when these systems are used, what the system is tailored to do is victimize communities that are already over-policed. That is communities of color, unhoused individuals and immigrants by using the cloak of scientific legitimacy and the supposed unbiased nature of data. The article continues to state that there are financial incentives for using these technologies. The author says that experts have pointed out that these algorithms often draw from flawed and non-transparent scores, such as gang databases, which have been subject to public scrutiny due to their lack of transparency. And so these events have touched our own communities. In June of this year, a group of mathematicians, including Kathy O'Neill, author of Weapons of Math Destruction, declared a boycott against helping to create predictive policing tools. Over 1,500 other researchers joined the boycott, which states that given the structural racism and brutality in US policing, we do not believe that mathematicians should be collaborating with police departments in this manner. It is simply too easy to create a scientific veneer for racism. Please join us in committing to not collaborating with the police. It is, at this moment, the very least we can do as a community. We demand that any algorithm with potential high impact face a public audit. The letter also concludes with a call to all departments with data science courses to implement learning outcomes that address the ethical, legal, and social implications of these tools. This article was written by the computer science community. It was in response this summer to Springer Nature publication by Harrisburg University called A Deep Neural ne Network Model to Predict Criminality Using Image Processing. The paper claimed to prove with some accuracy that one could predict crime using facial recognition. By June 22nd, over 2,435 researchers, practitioners, and students spanning various fields signed this letter titled Abolish the Tech to Prison Pipeline. 
The Letter to Springer is definitely worth reading because it outlines why data validity cannot be solved with more cleaning or more data collection, and that having a face that looks a certain way doesn't cause an individual to commit a crime. The scary part about the original publication by Harrisburg University is that their intent was that these findings would be eventually used by law enforcement agencies and other intelligence agencies to prevent crime. Anyways, within two weeks, the publication did pull the article. This summer, we also saw several companies pledge to shut down predictive policing platforms. Among them were Microsoft, IBM, and Amazon. I'm going to pause for a moment and say that it's a bit more complicated than this. One of the critiques of these company decisions in the wake of protesters nationwide and globally calling for an end to police brutality and racial profiling is that these decisions do not heavily impact the bottom line of such companies. Microsoft president Brad Smith has said that Microsoft has not sold its facial recognition technology to departments and the company has backed legislation in California that would allow police use of the technology with some restrictions. Similarly, Amazon has promised to ban police use of its facial recognition technology for a year. What happens after that year? Only time will tell. However, it's a start that there's concern over the ethical use of technologies such as facial recognition and conversations about fairness and bias in our data models. The movie Picture a Scientist talks about the biases that we as humans have. Ultimately, these biases are embedded in our systems and through our data collection and models. In it, an MIT biologist says that people are more fallible than we thought. Men are preferred to women for the same accomplishments. One of the studies, that, studies they administered was the IAT, which is the Implicit Association Test. It works on the assumption of two things that are paired together in our mind and how we will, over time, associate those two things as belonging together. The test is usually done with words and timed. One female scientist took the, the IAT te um, test as it related to men, women, and scientific careers and found that it took significantly more time to make associations between women and technical or career-oriented career fields, even for herself. A similar study was done in which persons were told that two applicants were applying for lab manager jobs. Their only differences were their names. In this case, one was named Jennifer and the other John. They told the evaluators that both persons applied to be lab manager over the course of the last year. What they found was that the female in an assessment of the two applicants that were identical on paper besides their gender was consistently viewed as less competent, less likely to be hired, less likely to be mentored by a faculty member and given a lower starting salary. A paper that draws upon this IAT example and of the lab manager application assessment is a paper published in 2016 titled, Man is the Computer Programmer as Woman is the Homemaker, Debiasing Word Embeddings. In the paper, they show that Google News articles exhibit male-female gender stereotypes. They develop a framework for debiasing the kinds of associations I was talking about in the IAT that lead to bias with words such as female and receptionist. The paper talks about associations of reasoning, such as a sentence where you can infer father is to doctor as mother is to nurse. They show that words such as mathematician and geometry have a strong male bias. And this is caused by other factors that are intertwined with our associations of gender. Here is a popular XKCD comic. I think it's a great example of showing something like group attribution bias. Group attribution error is the human tendency to believe that an individual's characteristics always follow the beliefs of a group that they belong to or a group's decisions reflect the feelings of all, all the members. In this case, because the person in the right image has ascribed an inability to do mathematics as a group to girls, an individual girl is only represented by that group and not as an individual who might be able to do mathematics. So what is the result of bias and unfair systems? What does it mean in terms of opportunities or lack thereof for specific groups or individuals and populations? Well, it means that persons can be rejected for home ownership, loans, job or jobs based on algorithms that determine them to be ineligible without recourse, regardless of their individual accomplishments or status in society. 
The paper, Fair Decision Making Using Privacy Protected Data, talks about the effects of adding noise on data and how this disproportionately affects some groups over others. It talks about the impact of common privacy algorithms as it relates to inequity. These affect policy decisions, such as allocated funding and voting, resulting in various disparity outcomes. My research specifically focuses on looking at how we can begin, begin to audit fairness and bias in deep learning models. Specifically, we have begun to look at ways in which we can identify whether a prediction in a deep learning system is based on group attribution, that is, how an individual is viewed as a member of a group or an individual prediction. For this, we created prediction sensitivity, which attempts to measure this. You can imagine in the case of a person who might determine that a system was unfair, say that the algorithm judged the person unfairly based on whether they were from an underrepresented group rather than as an individual. So right now, deep learning systems produce very unfair results with respect to this for specific individuals. What this means is that even though on average, it may give a fair result as declared by the system, for an individual, it can be really, really unfair. These kinds of mitigations are going to become more and more important as companies harvest more data, as users give us more data, and as we create models and systems that rely on predictions based on data. So we presented our preliminary results at the Mechanism Design for Social Good Conference this summer, and we have recently submitted a preprint to another upcoming workshop. We've written a paper on what we found so far, which looks promising, and we're looking at ways to make it better. So far, the results are, they do look promising, but there's so much that we can do to make fairness and privacy better. The work I do touches on both the impact of privacy and fairness in AI. These are difficult problems that the research community is working on. There is so much more we can do to embed trust and accountability in our systems. When our, our current systems fail, it doesn't just affect individuals, it affects families and entire industries. We as technologists can do better. So we've gone through a whirlwind of topics and our journey today is about to end. I hope that you enjoyed the time today and I look forward to the next adventure. Before I end, I'd like to thank my advisors, Dr. Joe Nair and Dr. Amitosh, and the Plaid Lab at the University of Vermont for supporting me and continuing to support me in my research. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much, Principal. This has been an incredibly insightful and informative talk on what is a very important and timely issue. Uh, we have a lot of amazing questions that have come in through the chat, so, so I can get to as many as possible. I'm going to dive right in. So first question um, from Katie is, how can we properly distinguish between private information and general information in the lens of differential privacy? So um, in the realm of differential privacy, um, in particular, the way we can think about um, private information and general information is that there are two ways of thinking about it. So legally, private information is defined often by protected attributes. So uh, legal definitions of things like um, sex, race, gender, um, that's not something in a data set, that's not information that should be publicly available, um, given that, that legal definition of protected attributes. The second is that um, in particularly differential privacy, we want um, to learn about the groups or in, rather than individuals. So it should be, the public information should be about a group, but not necessarily a specific individual. And that's how we would distinguish between the two. Thank you. So next question um, from Myra is, does differential privacy guarantee privacy protection against privacy attacks? So differential privacy, um, does not provide protection in this case. It, it only uh, protects the output of the program. So um, there's, if the person has auxiliary, if they, um, we have to remember that the, if, if we have, so the assumption of differential privacy is based on two things. There's a central model of differential privacy and there's a local model. And the central model assumes that the analyst querying is a trusted person 
um, so that the, the that we can trust the individual who's doing the query. The local uh, version, which is often used on things like our devices or phones when applying differential privacy, assume that we can't trust that central analyst who's querying the data. So therefore, um, it it's not it, depending on how you define differential privacy. There is certainly no guarantee, and that's why you often see a hybridization of uh, in the real world practice of deployments of differential privacy and other forms of secure computation. Great. So everyone, um, if you have any additional questions, feel free to please pop them in the comments and in the chat. And Crystal, I kind of just wanted to turn it over again to you for some closing thoughts while people uh, submit a few more questions. What, you know, this is obviously a big topic, an important topic, as you said, right now more than ever in our current times, we're seeing bigger issues with this. What is a key takeaway that people really should be focusing on kind of when, when going down this rabbit hole and, and entering, entering the world of differential privacy? What's a, a big piece of advice you can, can give? Um, I, so going, I think one of the most important things that I, because I'm still doing my PhD, um, that I'm kind of taking away is just that uh, you kind of have to have both both um, insights and in terms of how people might see the world. And this is particularly true, I mean, Trinidad and Tobago, for example, is a developing country, um, or at this point it's developed, but um, people, we have to keep in mind that although we have all these practices in what we consider to be first world countries that people in various parts of the world don't see things the same. And um, therefore, when we deploy these systems and we make these systems that we don't, we should also anticipate that these systems are going to be deployed and used in countries that the persons who made them didn't originally intend. Um, and this is, this is particularly a, a subject that I care a lot about because I have seen in my country of birth where uh, a lot of things that are manufactured or things that are deployed end up in my country. And there's often not, um, there, there, there's not the personnel that is trained to fix these things. Um, and sometimes they are deployed in ways that, that are unintentional or that aren't employed, deployed correctly. And um, therefore, the risk assessment is a huge, huge deal. I mean, think not just about it's going the fact that it might be deployed in the the most ideal scenario, but the idea that it might end up in countries or in places that you didn't intend. Mm -hmm. No, that's a, an excellent point. Um... Well, thank you so much, Crystal. This has been a, a wonderful talk. Oh, wait, we have one more question that just popped in. So I will we'll dive into this um, a question from Rob. So how do organizations use differential private algorithms to publish demographic information or other statistical aggregates while ensuring confidentiality of survey responses, for example? Oh, that's a really great question, Rob. So one of the ways that the census is a great example of a company that uses, or an organization that uses differential privacy. There's several great papers that I can link to. Uh, there's an individual named uh, Baud, John Baud, I believe is his name. And my advisor, Joe Nair, has also written some really great articles on, on NIST about, the, about differential privacy and applications. But one of the, the census has great examples in that they have deployed differential privacy on a federal and a local level, and they use that block data to protect the data of individuals. So um, as I spoke about in the presentation, they limit the block data cells on the local level to, to groups of 100,000 persons. And they also do it in a way that allows the populations to be grouped or clustered in homogenous groups. Because if you have, for example, a group cluster where we have an outlier, an individual who sticks out, then you kind of compromise their, you can compromise their, their privacy. So they make sure that their groups have a certain degree of uh, homogeneity, and they also have these block levels within which privacy, the differential privacy works. And um, so, yeah, but there's a lot of, of information out there in terms of how the, the census uh, deploys differential privacy. 
um, I'm trying to find the, the um, yeah, it's, I think his name's about, about John About, um, has written a lot of articles on that. So I'd, I'd like to give him credit for that. Um, yeah, and NIST also has great articles on differential privacy. Great, thank you so much, Crystal. Again, this has been a wonderful talk. Um, and thank you again. Thank you to everyone who joined live and for sharing all of your um, knowledge on this subject. We really appreciate you joining us today. Um, and for all of you who tuned in, thank you so much uh, for being a part of Egg on Air. And we'd like to encourage everyone to tune in to our next session, which um, we will be putting a slide up in one second to share details about that. So yes, two upcoming talks. So we have one next week um, with Greg Nelson, Beyond Unicorns, Designing the Workforce of the Future, and the beginning of November with Nicole Alexander, The Continued Move to Explainable AI. So thank you again, Crystal and everyone.